take me down to the Pollock. I want to go to the Pollock. Take me down to the futurist city where the grass is green and the girls are pretty. We'll never build your home. No, oh, no. Oh. All right, that's blowing everyone's ears out. You don't well, need your eardrums. Welcome to the podcast. This is Ought, I swear. And I'm your host, Vanessa Van Olstein. And I'm your co-host, Katie Gibbs. And we're going to take you down, back down, to modernism. Part two. Part two. And we're sorry for the delay in our recording. We had some technical difficulties. My family is technically difficult at the moment. Yeah, she's she's got the, the six. The six. And then I had to take the cats to the vet, so that screwed up, like, one day. Technical difficulties, my friends. Yeah, technical purring difficulties. Where we last left off, we were... Vaguely around World War II. So that puts us in Bauhaus? 30s, 40s. Yeah, we were talking about the Bauhaus. It's, it's probably the most influential art school of the 20th century. If you look at what comes out of it, you're going to be like, I know that building, I know that textile, I know that painting, I know that piece of furniture, I know that like graphics design font. I know Fonts that, are cool, friends. I know, I know that 80s synth band, that's 80s synth band. The, the, the. You just want to say that you know things, don't you? And now for Katie Gibbs singing her version of Our House once again, because you haven't heard it enough. Bar house in the middle of our street. Bar house. It's a place that can't be beat. Bar house. Take it down, Vanessa. I'm done. I, I already made fun of that other band from the 80s who's into metal and sings Paradise City. Is that, do one of them wear a top hat? I'm like, (laughs) I'm so bad at the names of things. Like so much of my brain is allocated to lyrics to crappy songs, but I can't remember who sang them. Oh, well. All right, tell them about Ball House. Oh, I already told them about Ball House. We're done. No. Um, Did we educate the people enough? No. I, during the period of time we were supposed to put this out, Stuff You Missed in History Class actually put out a really cool 30-minute uh, episode on the women of the Ball House that I encourage you to listen to. And they do make the very legitimate point that I've said before. The bad part about the Ball House is they tend to... Slow down. You're going... I like to talk as fast as I can. The Bauhaus tended to push women into textiles or weaving or uh, female appropriate arts, art school version of home ec. So there were a few women artists who um, said, screw you guys, I'm going to be an architect anyway, even though my lady parts are lady parts. But they were few and far between. And I have to say that they probably had bigger cojones than some of the men there. Aside from the point, you should really go check out that podcast from Stuff You Missed in History Class because I love those two ladies. They are fantastic. Somebody said I reminded them of Holly Fry, and I told them that Holly Fry ought to slap them. So That's fair. So Holly, if you ever listen to this podcast, please go slap that person. Anyways, there's a lot of innovation that comes out of the ball house. If you look at the... Did I already say if you look at the artwork from it, you're going to know what it is. I, you have to forgive us. This is our third time recording this podcast today due to actual technical difficulties. And my laptop insisting that I really need to install Windows 10. It's 99% complete. Uh. It just, it's been a day. So anyway, Bauhaus is actually quite influential even today. It's very recognizable in, in the architecture that we have in a lot of font styles, in... Industrial design. Yeah. Well, and there's innovations that come out of it. They really kind of perfect plywood. They really kind of perfect plywood. Um, Cardboard, corrugated cardboard was one. And they had this idea that when you come together as artists and architects, and even people in the sciences later, which becomes more of a shift with like Maholi Nagy. It's N-A-G-Y. Okay. It, you don't speak German, don't worry about it. <laughs> I think he was Austrian, not that that's very different language-wise. They believed that by having this holistic school approach, we were kind of a renaissance man of the arts, and 
at least take big steps into like every platform of art and uh, industrial design and architecture, you learn more about the practicality of the subject and that this makes you a better artist. They also, and there's actually modern schooling that's derived from the ball house. Katie, would you stop laughing at the Windows 10 upgrade screen on my laptop? <laughs> it is really distracting. The piece of artwork I would say look at is uh, Herbert Bayer's Universal Bayer from 1925. Ball House starts out in what's called the Weimar Republic. They kind of break up when Hitler comes to power. because And there are some members of the Ball House that are killed in the Holocaust. Well, because they would be deviants and or... Some, some of them were Jewish. Some of them were gay. Uh, and they were artists who so, yeah, didn't that support didn't the right. So... So a lot of them after that then break apart. There's the ball house comes back together after World War II. Uh, they start some very prominent schools here in the United States. Some of them go off to Russia because like most artists in this period, it's a bunch of communist bastards. Ha <laughs> ha. Now we have World War II, um, which is like World War One, the sequel. That's why they call it World War Two. Oh my gosh. Um, so we actually touched on the horrors of war last time, so I don't want to belabor it this time. You can pick up any history book and learn about World War II. And the biggest thing is that a lot of artists end up in Europe. Well, a lot of artists from Europe end up in either the United States or Sweden, and it heralds the Atomic Age. <laughs> For those of you that don't know because you skipped high school history, kind of dropped two nuclear bombs on Japan. And this starts something called the Cold War, where we, you know, are in a pissing contest with Russia over who could make the bigger, better bomb and not detonate it. Please never detonate those on people again. President Obama just went to Japan this year, and it was his first trip to... It's either going to be Hiroshima or Nagasaki. I want to say it was Hiroshima, and he didn't apologize for the actions, but he did stress how horrible they were and how it should never happen again and these weapons should be dismantled. And when we're talking about modernism, one of the things that we belabored over and over again, it's that technology and the changing climate of the world changes how artwork is viewed, created, depicted. Instead of the horrors of gassing people and machine guns, there's a nuclear bomb that measures death tolls in the millions. And if that doesn't scare you, I really don't know. <laughs> I don't know how to scare you after that because that's terrifying and... And then there's the new like hopeful rebuilding in the United States that occurs. Uh, new York City becomes the official like capital of the art world because they're not having to rebuild it like they were Paris. Mm -hmm. So this refocus on the like new growing America with all of its like warehouse jobs and it's gee great atomic age look we have nuclear power um, you know it's going to shift people's perspective on artwork. A lot of it becomes much more abstract as a result and much more thoughtful. One of the really exciting people we're going to mention at this point that you also have to understand to get United States artwork after World War II is the critic Clement Greenberg. I'm going to read an excerpt from the artstory.org. Um, if you remember, we're actually going through so many styles through the modernism period that we've pulled from several different websites and we will credit where we can. It says that Clement Greenberg was probably the single most influential art critic in the 20th century. Although he's most closely associated with his support for abstract expressionism, and in particular Jackson Pollock, who we're going to discuss in a moment, his views closely shaped the work of many other artists, including Helen Frankenthaler, M Morris Lewis, and Kenneth Noland. His attention to the formal properties of art, color, line, space, and so forth, his rigorous approach to criticism, and his understanding of the, de of the development of modern art, although they have all been challenged, have influenced generations of critics and historians. And there's actually a quote, I would not deny being one of those critics who educate themselves in public. Kind of sum up Greenberg. He writes this treatise on art that starts from the like peasants and the realist movement, drags it through what's existed of modernism, 
and comes out with the concept of the hand in art that is the gesture of the artist that shows off the essence of the art is more important than any form of subject or topic or trope that is really covered in art. And if you've ever seen the movie Pollock, Greenberg is in that movie. He's the chubby, bald art critic, and they don't really explain who he is in the movie very well. Like, I feel like if you don't know about art, you wouldn't know that this is the critic that really made Jackson Pollock. He just kind of comes across as this, like, critical guru. Right. So if you watch that movie again, it might make a little more sp sense knowing who Greenberg is. And he's really... The break with Greenberg's tenants is going to be what causes postmodernism and beyond. Because at that point, everybody kind of gives the finger and says, well, there is no rules. Whereas Greenberg's still trying to make this very academic and understood. And he's part of what isolates quote modern art from the general public he's not as interested in the public understanding as he is art just kind of existing for art's sake art for art's sake now there's a great transition for jackson pollock <clears throat> and for jackson pollock we're gonna start talking about the abstract expressionists that's mm -hmm. right kids number one lavender mist 1950 by jackson pollock we would describe it to you but my friends if you've seen a jackson pollock you know vaguely what we are looking at they called him jack the dripper he, in the artwork that he's the best known for he would lay it on the ground and rhythmically drip the art onto the canvas with these like very kind of dancer gestures and it's about rhythm it's about the mark of the artist and kind of the mechanical quality of like art and design at this point so basically we are to appreciate the creation of of the art by the artist as opposed to the piece of artwork itself. Yeah, we're not interested in narrative, whereas an impressionist piece kind of tells a story of a moment. A Pollock tells the story of the essence of creating art, quote, art for art's sake. When you're looking into it and you're trying to see something specific to the painting, that's not accurate. Take a step back, let the whole thing envelop you, and just have an experience with the raw basic element of art and gesture and movement. We're thinking about jazz again with Pollock. He listened to a lot of like really quick music while he did that because it helped with quote the rhythm of the piece. I will say that he didn't have a lot of forethought into how these works are going to stand the test of time because if I recall correctly he used things like house paint he used pretty much what he had on hand. And so now they're starting to deteriorate because they don't have the same consistency and durability as your regular oil paint. There are some Pollocks in museums that cannot be taken out of storage or they will fall apart the second they're exposed to light, which drives up the value of the existing ones that are stable. But it also brings in a question about the value of art, the long-term value of art, the long-term importance of art and how does the fact that he didn't care enough to make it archival influence how you perceive the art. We're also talking about when Pollock was moving and when he was creating these works, he was smoking, I think almost a chain smoker. Oh, and yeah. if the ash fell in while he on the canvas while he's working, that ash stayed there, my friends. His footprints stayed there. Yeah, his finger... One of the ways they authenticate Pollux is his fingerprints are all over them. So it's, again, it's about the creation of the work. Yeah, and it it's also, to use a word that we use a lot back then, monumental. A lot of abstract expressionists are monumental. When we talk about de Kooning, they're very big. When we talk about... Um, Krasner, Pollock's wife, who deserved as much credit and fame as he got, but people like Greenberg weren't that interested in because she was a woman artist. And if you're going, oh, I heard Phil Helen Frankenthaler when you were talking about him. Yeah, uh, Greenberg kind of, that was his girlfriend for a long time, Helen Frankenthaler. That's why he was interested in her career. I, I hate to say that. She's an awesome artist. She deserves the acclaim. She deserves the place in history. But so do several other, other women female artists. artists. 
who were not sleeping with Clement Greenberg. Well, in this, there's also at this point, and all through modernism, an erasure of people of color are invisible during this period of time. It's not just women. It's it's only my lifetime, maybe about 10 years before, that we've seen that even just kind of start to change, and there's still a lot of problems. So don't hashtag feminist me like it's some kind of dirty thing. Another artist that kind of straddles the line here between abstract expressionist and one of the next steps we take that's color field is Mark Rothko. He starts out with these big, bold, like, painting gestural things that are like black and white and it's this like line that's drug across in a rhythmic form on these monumental canvases but he quickly moves over into what's considered some of the most boring art color field color field my disdain for color field i'm sorry i i i can appreciate that it exists but i can't I, I cannot embrace this one. I love you. You know what? It's okay to have opinions about art. As we covered in the Manners podcast, though, don't be a dick about it in the middle of the museum. And I'm going to admit, color field, a lot of minimalism, I really, really struggle with. I tend to not like it. I have no problems with figures and art. In fact, I usually find them whimsical and fun. But color field is where you're going to hear a lot of people say that they don't get modern art or they don't like modern art. And the Rothko we're talking about is technically untitled, but it has a subtitle of yellow orange, yellow light orange, and it's from 1955. And it is a monumental sized canvas of yellow orange, yellow, and light orange. Yeah, they just transition into each other using these squares. If you're ever in Houston, there's the Rothko Chapel, which is a, it's a chapel. Beautiful place to get married, but there's just these big black squares. And if you want to know how to appreciate this kind of art, if you'd like to approach it in person and try to understand it a little bit more, stand in front of it, let the color reflect onto you and just kind of become lost in the color. Whatever thoughts you're having, whatever impressions you get, however it settles with you is correct. We are not looking for a narrative in this piece of work. Also, pro tip, don't take me along. Yeah, it's it's the sleepy part. Well, let's, let's mention a style that pops up about this time that's kind of fingering Mr. Greenberg with the middle magic bird finger. Oh, I like that finger. I use it a lot. Mm. And uh, it's pop art. Oh, no. We're into Warhol land. Warhol land. And our example piece from this would be Warhol's Campbell Soup Cans, 1962. It's a grid of soup cans. Now here, Pollock, not Pollock, <laughs> Now here, Warhol has removed the presence of the hand from the work. These are screen prints. He started out in advertising. And when you look at his pieces, they are identical except for the type of soup. Like it's a, you know, tomato next to chicken noodle, next to chicken stars, next to beef bowl, whatever the soup type. Mm -hmm. But otherwise completely identical. And it's a commentary on popular advertising media in the 60s. Right. So it's bringing a lower form of art and in air quotes to high art. And basically what they're, what he's doing is forcing us to acknowledge basic everyday things as art, like soup cans. And the quote from, uh, let's, I didn't write down, I think this is Wikipedia actually. By the late 1950s and early 1960s, a cultural revolution was underway led by activists, thinkers, and artists who sought to rethink and overturn what was, in their eyes, a stifling social order ruled by conformity. The Vietnam War, inflicted mass protests. The civil rights movement sought for equality for African Americans and the women's liberation movement gained momentum. If you read the manifesto for pop art, it's all about making these affordable for everybody, bringing art into every home and exposing people to the artfulness of just our lives. And you could actually tie a really easy correlation between how Warhol started approaching pop art from his advertising and to how marketing is today how it is so ingrained in our lives because before that you didn't usually have you didn't say i want some can like a i want a coke you would say i would like a soda please these name brands have started just filtering into our lives like that and i think it's easily traceable to 
Warhol. And as an evil marketer, I do think it is safe to say that Warhol was kind of the grandfather of modern marketing. He even marketed what's basically a lifestyle brand. Andy Warhol is as much a product as those Campbell's soup cans are, and that's part of what sold him. Accurate. Accurate statements are accurate. So let's step back into the boring realm. The other one that I don't really care for, minimalism. Oh, I'll Rochambeau you for who gets to talk about this because I'll fall asleep. You know what? I'm just going to do like a short and dirty summary. Characterized by precise, hard-edged, unitary, geometric form, rigid planes of color, it... it at this point, what kind of happens is there's, quote, the death of paint. Greenberg's concepts of the purity of form reach a point where it's about these, like, basic geometric shapes, and the, to him, they need to exist outside of the canvas, on the floor, in a thing that you're forced to interact with that is beautifully simple, that is purely art, and changes the space as well as the... So you see things like Donald Jones galvanized iron 17 from january 1973 and i think we discussed it at the beginning of we the did. first modernism podcast but it is the four steel cubes lined up in a row put against a wall in an installation at a gallery and at this point the concept behind the art has become so crucial Ajad doesn't actually make the he pays somebody or a, a manufacturing place to actually make the work. There's another artist similar to this that's from this period named Saul LeWitt. And you don't buy a Saul LeWitt. You buy the instructions to make a Saul LeWitt. I remember that. Yeah, and Judd's actually a uh, art critic as well. So he's shaping the concept of what is art at the same time he's producing art, which I, I feel like needs pointing out. I really feel like, I've never seen a picture of him, but I feel like you should have the typical black French beret and some shades on, even though it's your indoors, and like that cigarette, but it's one of those thin, long, hipster cigarettes. I feel like he should be one of those people. Please don't dissuade me from my delusion. I can see you googling him right now. I want to double check. I he Everything I remember of him from photos I've actually seen is he's kind of like proto hips. See, I, I know what I'm talking about. If you're going to manufacture a manufacturing of four steel cubes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, like he's kind of your 70s wild haired, bushy faced, like proto hipster. That's not ruling out the beret and the smoking and the glasses. Oh, no, I'm sure it happened at some point. We all, we all have a thing. If you're going, gee, man, sounds kind of like conceptual art. That's because that's kind of really what comes next. It's all starting to bleed together because with the increase in connectivity with newspapers becoming more worldwide, with TV becoming so much broader and so uh, communication levels are reaching higher and higher and higher. So all these ideas are being thrown into one big melting pot. We don't have the internet yet, but it's still so much easier to communicate something than it was even 20 years before this. And I think it's interesting to consider that in a period where mass communication makes it to where everything is so much more available, that art becomes more and more about an idea. Because you're even starting to see things show up on television, like, you know, in the 80s, we have Twin Peaks which is surrealist film in a TV show and very hard to watch. But it I've watched it just so that I can say I did. <laughs> Thank you, David Lynch. Um, nice thing about conceptual art, though, which it's a period that really, it, it really occurs in the 70s. And it goes alongside the feminist art movement. So uh, one of the big things that comes out of conceptual art is performance art which is art that's about the essence of performance. It's not quite theater, it's not quite, quite music, it's not quite dance. And a lot of women are able to get on board with that because they can push the feminist agenda through their artworks. It's a stepping stone for a lot of like very hardcore political art. Because if you haven't noticed, art's always pretty political. It just keeps getting even more so after this point. 
And one of those female performance slash feminist artists I would like to talk about is Myrna Abramovic. I've seen her recently on YouTube as part of a, uh, a retrospective in 2010. And one of the pieces she performed was called The Artist is Present. She wore this beautiful red dress and sat at this kind of, in these kind of oversized chair with like a regular table. And you were supposed to walk up sit down across from her she's got her eyes closed and then she lifts her head up and opens her eyes and you have this silent exchange well there was a male artist that she did a lot of work with and they decided at the end of one of their performance pieces that they were going to separate and never make work again they hadn't seen each other like 30 years and he comes and he sits down and she has no idea he's showing up. She has her eyes closed. So when she lifts her head and opens her eyes, there is her old lover, aged, changed, a new man. And she doesn't even hear his voice. They just have this like really moving, teary moment together. And it's beautiful. Building upon some other pieces that she did, like, um, Rhythm Zero from 1974. Katie, go beat your dog. It's down a bunch of items on a table. And it's... It's everything from, like, a feather, to a pair of scissors, to a knife, to a gun, to a rose. And she just lets people do whatever they want. This escalated, and somebody actually cocked the trigger and put the gun to her and at that point they shut down the performance and if you hear her talk about it she was absolutely frightened like she was convinced she was going to get shot because people had been cutting her clothes off and doing stuff like that and if this reminds you of another piece by Yoko Ono where she let people come at her with a pair of scissors and they end up cutting off her clothes same period she did not break up the Beatles her breaking up the Beatles is highly exaggerated. Sorry, I just... You don't have anything to add? I have nothing for this, because... Well, you know what? If somebody that's not that interested in contemporary art is Abramovic, at least, interesting? She is, and I'm... I feel better knowing the story behind it, and more terrified at humanity. Yeah, no. It's, you know, it's performance art. It gets a little squirrely. But... Uh, also, there's um, Joseph. Help me with the last name. Kusht. All right, I'm gonna. I'm, I'm gonna, gonna say Kusht. Kusht. Uh, one in three chairs, 1965. Good. And so, the installation is a physical chair, a picture of a chair, and also the description of a chair. And this is conceptual art in one photo of a photo of an object of a photo of a definition of a I feel like we should do that mirror thing where you look in the mirror and it's a mirror image of you and then there's a mirror behind you and it just keeps going down and down and down and down the infinite mirrors yeah mirror. it's and he's trying to stress the three representations of a chair how is an actual chair different from the photo of a chair different from the word of a chair is the concept all kind of the same is there an emblematic quality of chair or is it just still a chair and it's okay with some of these periods i think if you're like well i have an opinion one way or another that's fine they're asking you to think approach this as a thinking person as somebody that wants to have an experience not as somebody that expects a narrative once again you're providing your own narrative and it's legitimate to be like this kind of reminds me of how purple would smell okay that would work for lavender mist the key notion to take home from this your key metaphor motif message that's the word i'm looking for the key message is basically there are no wrong answers when you're looking in into one of these pieces now if you tell an artist that it looks like how purple would smell they might look at you a little funny in fact i would bet they look at you a little funny yeah unless maybe they threw violet water on it which i've never done anyways um, but that that doesn't mean that you're wrong in your assumption that you think that that is how purple would smell 
Yeah, and if you're in front of a giant painting of the color red, and you're like, well, it's about red. Yes, you're right. Don't overthink it. Yeah. it's I, There's this concept, because art's become so academic, that you have to have this, like, crazy academic theory to understand it. No, sometimes a chair is just a chair is just a chair is just the definition of a chair. Chair, 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 chair. Tasers. Not again. <laughs> So, at the end of conceptual art heralds, hopefully, the postmodernist movement. Postmodernism! It kind of starts in the early 80s. Oh, thank you. I mean, I think that I, I have loved these podcasts because I have actually learned something and enjoyed Abramovic. Abrama Vanovic. Yeah, that's she's Eastern European. That's it's a Slavic name. It's just hard to say. Right. And postmodernism is it what's going on now? There's some arguments that we're post postmodernist. There's some arguments that this is a new period that doesn't have a definition yet. That postmodernism is really over, even though it's thirty something years old at best. Which, if you look at these other periods, not really um and there are little things that happen within postmodernism that still are part of postmodernism but basically it's giving you permission to draw from all of these ideas in the past and really just kind of make art whatever it needs to be for you so the take home is it vanessa over explains vanessa over explains and katie is better left to pot shards and pre-columbian art Uh, But that modernism definitely changed how we view art now. And it changed in a parallel time with how communication rose and how we as a society became a quote unquote modern society. And will the term modernism stick for art from about 1900 to about 1970, 80? Maybe not. They could change their mind later. It could completely change, and that's okay. They might say that modernism is still going on. They might say that it was never... They might say that it was sheep times. Who knows? But the flexibility is part of the attractiveness. It is. And I feel like there's something attractive about looking at the world you're in and responding to it creatively however you choose to do that even if you were just giving that world a finger and going to make like moss covered birdhouses in a cave somewhere can i buy one of your moss covered birdhouses from your cave let's talk about how i'm going to extract payment <laughs> oh my oh. All right, well, kids, we have wrapped up modernism. It has been a long two-part session. Um, I want to thank Vanessa for putting up with me through the modernism. There was kicking, there was screaming, there was gnashing of teeth and pulling of hair. And that was just a day. She Um, licked me. I don't think she'll ever live that down. No. Um, Do we have any uh, shout-outs for today? I'm going to give a shout out to Craig Martell, who's a science fiction like adventure writer. If you're looking for a series of fun kind of like mid-century feeling sci-fi novels, check out Craig Martell, and that's M-A-R-T-E-L-L-E. Shout out! Can I do a shout out? Can we have two shout outs? Yeah, sure. Why not? Yay! Um, I'm going to give a shout out to Vinifica Corsetry out of Austin, Texas, because that lovely woman is making me a custom Captain America corset so that I can go to Austin Comic Con coming up in September. Um, Vanessa's shaking her head, but seriously, look up her Etsy shop. She's got some wonderful work. I highly recommend it. Don't judge me. It was Doctor Who, it was Loki, and now it's Captain America, and I'm just trying to like plot this out in my head. We should do a podcast on Katie's fan art obsessions. Technically, it's because I'm meeting the Winter Soldier, so I'm going to be the off play to his... It's been um, partially sponsored by Socially Stunning. Are you looking for SEO, marketing, 
Help me out here. Web, web page branding. Web, web page branding. Management. Do I have to plug my own company? God no, damn you it, just Kate. have to just tell shut me. up. Just shut up. No, it's tell it, me what you do. In front cry every time you see me. Editing. Yeah, social media marketing, brand management, reputation management, community management. Uh, She's I also write content for web pages, bloggers. If you need a web page built. If I don't do it, I know a subcontractor who does, and I can make managing them super easy. I am good with creatives because of experience. So go to socially-stunning.com. Dot com. Dot com. I got it right, y'all. So socially-stunning.com for all your needs. Also, just as a side note, please check out beautiful blurbs. Dot U.S. Dot U.S. <clears throat> If you're an artist, if you're a writer, if you're somebody who does not want to talk about yourself, but you love that you have the creative output, beautiful. If you need a bio, if you need a bio, if you need a book jacket, go to Beautiful Blurbs. That place is for you because we will talk about you, so you don't have to. Shut up, Katie. Have a creative day. Bye, y'all. See you next time. Art I Swear would like to thank Joe Giggs. If you're looking for a postmodernist DJ in the New York City area, well, Broadway boogie woogie on to Joe Giggs. Joe Giggs takes samples with permissions from the Conant Project by Iridial.